Okay, I'm going to be in Luke chapter 17. If you want to open up there. Um, Luke chapter 17, and I'll, I'll begin in about verse 5. So, you know, Matthew chapter, I'm telling you to turn to Luke, and then I'm going to refer to Matthew, but that's all right. Uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could tell a mountain to move from here to there, and it would do it. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? Amen. Pretty small. In fact, I should have brought one up here. It'd be, it'd be like a BB, maybe a little bit small. So in the passage that we're using this morning in the uh, Luke chapter 17 passage, Jesus doesn't use the mountain, but he uses a mulberry tree. And he says, if you had faith the size of a mulberry tree, he says, you could tell this if you had faith the size of a mulberry tree. If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, that you could tell this mulberry tree to uproot itself and go throw it itself in the ocean, and it would do it. I don't know about you, I've never moved a mountain from here to there. Amen. I've never uprooted a tree. Not with just with my faith. I mean, I did it with a shovel. Oftentimes, I feel like my faith is lacking, for lack of a better word. I've often felt inadequate to the tasks at hand in my faith. You know, there have been times through the years, many, actually many years ago, um, there was a lady, I was in seminary, and I was pastoring a little church where I was in seminary, just outside of Course Canada, little cotton farming community, community about a hundred and something people. I mean, it was really small. And um, we had Sunday morning, we were having prayer, lady wanted prayer. She had apparently had, looked like she was, just been diagnosed with some cancer and she was going in that week and she wanted some prayer and, and uh, so I just prayed for her you know from the pulpit really wasn't any big deal but I just prayed for her of course I was young in seminary I was ready to you know I was ready to do battle with the devil if he wanted to come on I was ready to go you know and uh, so prayed a prayer for her just asked God to heal her and um, um, actually God did heal her and she told me she said a little bit later, and I don't know if Cheryl remembers this or not. Do you remember this, Christine Luther? And she told us later, she said, I knew from the moment that you prayed for me, she said, I knew I was healed. She said, I literally felt something like a shiver go through my entire body. She said, I was just standing there, and I just felt it going through my entire body, and I knew that I was healed. Amen, right? Amen. So, how come I can't do that every time? I'm serious. You know, I want to walk into the room of you, the hospital room of you or your loved one, and I want to pray for them, and I want them to go home the next day. Amen. That's the kind of faith I want to have. I, I mean, and yourself, this isn't just me. This isn't about me. This is about you too. Don't, don't, don't you want to have that kind of mustard seed faith, the kind where you can pray over a situation and that God will just, just do what it is that you've asked him to do? Amen. Don't you want to do that? I mean, if, it's, if, if you need to move a mountain in your life, don't you want to just say to that mountain, move from here and get over there, and that mountain go from here and get over there so that you can just be about your way? I want to have that kind of faith. I want to have that kind of faith. Amen. In fact, the disciples here in, in Luke chapter 17, uh, starting in verse 5, says, The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. That's where I'm at. Now you're talking my language. Let's, let's ask God, let's just increase our faith. Amen. Because I got to tell you, I think we're doing it wrong. I'm not so sure we're doing it wrong so much as we understand it wrong. So they test the Lord. They say, increase our faith. And so then the Lord says to them, if you have faith as a mustard seed... You can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now this next part makes no sense to me. He just asked them to increase their faith. Now listen to what he teaches them. Which of you having a servant plowing or tending a sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down and eat? But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my, for my supper? 
Gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you can eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded of him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, then just say, we are unprofitable servants, and we have done what it was our duty to do. Now I got to tell you, when I read that, and I read where they said, Lord, increase our faith, and then Jesus said, well, you know, if you had enough faith, you could just uproot this tree and, and tell it to go plant itself in the ocean, it would. And then he starts talking to them about, you know, if you had a servant, and we was coming at the end of the day, and they came in from work, would you just say, oh, you're so wonderful, sit down, let's have dinner. He said, no, you tell them, go cook me some dinner. Amen. That's what he said. And he said, and, and, and you're, 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 you're just a servant. And he said, when you've done everything which you're commanded, you're still going to say we're unprofitable and we have done what it was our duty to do. And I'm trying to make sense of this. What does this have to do with increasing our faith? What does this have to do with, Lord, increase our faith? Okay, well, if you have enough faith, you can uproot this tree. But now let me tell you this. Because here's what I think. Here's, here's, here's what I think is, is step number one. Mountain moving faith is really about just being faithful. Amen. It's, it's really about just being faithful. And I think that that's where Jesus wanted to start with them. They said increase our faith. And he said, you know what, in a roundabout way. He said, you know what, if you want to increase your faith, how about you just be faithful? How about you just be faithful to follow after me? How about you just be faithful to surrender yourself to me? How about you just be faithful to do the things that you know that I want you to do and to do the things that I've asked you to do? Faith just absolutely begins with faithfulness. It does. It just begins with our own faithfulness. Here's the problem, as I see it, not the problem, one of the problems, a part of the problem. We're more interested in uprooting trees and moving mountains than we are in serving our Lord. Amen. Here we go. Right here. We're, we're, we're more interested in doing something magnificent and grand that the world can see instead of just humbly serving the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. I want to stand over you and raise my hands and I want to pray and I want every infirmity that's in your body to just be healed. And I want, and I want, I want to do it. But do I just want to be faithful to God? Do I just want to serve Him? Do I just want to love Him? Do I just want to do what it is He asked me to do and what it is that He calls me to do? Listen, increasing our faith is going to start with us just being faithful. Amen. All right? Now I'm going to transition into the next part, which is probably more of what you would expect to hear. Because in the next part, they have this encounter which is very much about faith. But I, I, I want to do something first. The first thing I want to do is, is I want to kind of define faith for us. And this, this is, this is going to be important for us to get a grasp on. It's going to be important for you uh, to stay with me on this so that you won't go away thinking that I believe something that I don't. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 would be, in my opinion, a definition of faith. Not in my opinion, it is a definition of faith. It's a biblical de definition of faith. It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, and it's the evidence of things that are not seen. And then he goes on in the rest of chapter 11, and he gives a whole list of people uh, that we know from the Old Testament, great patriarchs and matriarchs of the Bible, that live by faith. But look, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. I think this is really important. I, I, really, I, I really think it's important for you to understand what I believe faith is so that you can understand the conclusions that I'm going to come to, or really the main conclusion that I'm going to come to here in just a second. First of all, he says, it's the substance of things hoped for. Faith has a very solid substance to it. I want to make this very clear. I need you to hear me on this right here. Faith is not wishful thinking. Amen. I, I need you to hear that. Faith is not... Just because I want it to happen, and if I want it to happen bad enough, that that means it has to happen, that's not faith. Alright? It's not. It's just not. It's not biblical faith. 
Biblical faith has a substance to it. It has a foundation to it. It has a substance and a foundation that is so certain that we know beyond any shadow of a doubt that it's going to happen even before it happens. Now, what, what can provide that substance? What can provide that, that sort of foundation? Well, clearly, it is only a promise from God. Amen. Clearly. Only a promise from God can we have the absolute confidence in that we know beyond any shadow of a doubt it's going to happen. If God promised it, then it's going to happen. And we can just bank on it. Amen. You cannot show me one example of faith in the Bible that wasn't based on a word from God. Okay. Every one of them was based on a word from God. I really need you to understand this. Because faith isn't just because I want it to happen that, and I can believe it's going to happen that that means it has to happen. That's not faith. Faith is a promise from God that I can live on and that I can bank on. Amen. Now God gives us many promises through His Word. And you can take any promise that's listed in His Word and you can live on it as if it's a reality right now, today. Amen. All right? Now God will also speak to you individually in your life. Okay? Throughout life, there will be things that will happen. There will be situations that you'll face. There will be things that will come up. And God will just speak to your heart through His Holy Spirit. He'll, he'll, he'll give you a piece about something. He'll, he'll use His Word to, to show you something and to reveal to you something. God will speak to you personally about situations that you're going through. And He may tell you something that's going to happen. He's done Amen. that for me several times. He's... he's, he's well, the church I was just telling you about where I prayed for the little lady. Listen, when I was going to that church, God, I was in seminary. We were in Fort Worth. I didn't have a job. Cheryl was working. She was pregnant. I was going to school. I felt like a heel, all right? I didn't have a job. Cheryl's working, pregnant. When Cheryl got pregnant, she got pregnant, all right? And, and so she's pregnant. She's working. She's supporting me while I'm going to school. Man, I had to have a church. I had to have something where I could feel like I was being useful. You know, God told me, He laid on my heart during one of my prayer talks. He laid on my heart the exact day. I believe it was July 14th. I don't remember. July 11th. He gave me an exact day. And I looked at the calendar and it was a Monday. Monday. All right. I just began to pray that God's sovereign will would be done on that Monday. Do you know what? On that Monday... I got a call from that little church. And they said, well, our little committee's meeting and we're looking for a pastor. Would you be interested in throwing your hat in the ring? Well, I wanted to say, you just found a pastor. I just want you to know that. But I said, okay, yeah, I'll go through the process, whatever you want. But look, but look my, my point here is that God will speak to you personally about things that he's going to do. And he'll give you a promise about those things. And, when, and that's your substance. And when we have these promises from God... Again, it has to be a promise from God. Amen. But when we have a promise from God, either through His Word or when He has spoken to you personally, then you can live on that promise as if it has already been fulfilled. That's the evidence of things that are not seen. Amen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It has a foundation. It has a substance to it. It is sure. It's the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. It is then the manifestation of something that hasn't happened yet. When God gives you a promise, true faith is when God gives you a promise and then you live like it's fulfilled before it's actually been fulfilled. That's what faith is. Faith is about the way you live. Faith isn't about what you believe. Faith isn't about what you say. Faith is about how you live. Amen. And when God gives you a promise, and when you have a promise from God, true faith is living as if that promise has already been fulfilled, even though it may currently... No, if it's faith, it is because it is yet unfulfilled. It is yet unfulfilled, but faith is living like it is already fulfilled. So that's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. That's kind of a definition of, fa definition of faith. Did I put it up there? Yeah. Living like a yet-to-be-fulfilled promise from God has already been fulfilled. That's my definition. All right, That's the one I just worked through as I, as I worked through this verse. So I wouldn't put a lot of stock in it. I wouldn't give it to any theologian or anything like that. That's just BK's uh, definite definition of what faith is. 
So, now back to Luke chapter 17. So, Jesus said, well, you want to be, you want to have faith? How about faithfulness? And then they had this encounter where I believe it's a great picture of exactly what I just defined for you. It, said, it happened, verse 11, starting verse 11, it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the middle of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a certain visit, village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood far off. And they lifted up their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And so when he saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priests. Listen, I, I wish our brothers that wrote these Bibles would have emphasized stuff. They just write it like it's nothing. Now, I, I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean it the way it touched my heart. Look at it. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. You catching that? Jesus heals from leprosy. Okay, go show yourself to the priest. As they went, they were healed from their leprosy. Amen. As they went, as they began to live out a promise from God, they were cleansed and they were healed from their leprosy. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he returned and with a loud voice he glorified God. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus said, well, were there not ten that were cleansed? Where are the nine? And were not any of them found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. But for me, for the point that I'm making here today about real faith, is that real faith is living on a promise from God. And look, I, as they went, they were healed. So they stood and they shouted at Jesus culturally during their time, during that day. Leprosy, terrible, contagious disease. They had to stay away from people. They weren't allowed to be near people. And in fact, they had to, if people were, began to come around you and you had leprosy, you had to yell out, unclean, unclean. You had to let people know not to get near you because you had this terribly contagious disease. You can read Leviticus chapter 14. If they were ever healed from leprosy and they wanted to be declared clean so that they could come back into the community, the first thing they had to do was go show themselves to the priest. Only the priest could, de could declare them clean and fit for community living again. So they cry out to Jesus. They don't dare get close to him. So they just holler at him. They cry out to him, have mercy on us, right? Cleanse us, have mercy on us. So Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. Step number one, when you're cleansed, go show yourself to the priest. The problem was, if they looked at themselves right then, they still had leprosy. Alright? But Jesus is in essence telling them, I've cleansed you, go show yourself to the priest. I don't see it. And then the scripture says that as they went, because they believed in the promise of God, and they believed in it enough to live like it was true, even though it had wasn't true yet, even though they believed enough to live like it was true. So as they went and as they lived it out, they were healed and they were cleansed of their leprosy. When Jesus, John chapter 2, if you read that little passage about the wedding feast at Cana where Jesus turned the water into wine and he told the people, you know, fill the water pots with water. And he said, now serve it. They're going, what? This is water. I'm, giving, I'm reading between the lines on that, all right? They, they were servants. They did what they were told, but they filled the water pots with water. Jesus said, serve it. They served it to the master of the feast. He said, this is great wine. He said, this is the best wine. Uh, he didn't know where it came from, uh, but verse I think it's verse 9 there of John chapter 2. It says, but the servants who drew the water knew. So here's what it's telling you. When they drew it out to go serve it, it was still water. Jesus said, fill the pot, water pots up with water. He said, now serve it. When they drew it out, it was still water. Sometime between the time they took it to the master of the feast and the time that he put it to his lips, it turned into wine. Here's the point. They lived out what they believed. Jesus said, serve it. They served it because Jesus said to, and the miracle happened in the serving because they were willing to live it out. In 1 Kings chapter 17, we were studying 1 Kings on on. Uh, on um, Wednesday night, Elijah comes on board, and for, Elijah's pretty cool, by the way. Uh, and so uh, he he uh, he declares a, a drought. Um, 
God tells him to go down to Zarephath. And he's going to be met there. And he comes to the gates of Zarephath in, in chapter 17. I think it starts in about, about verse 8. Um, what do I have? Yeah, I have it starting in verse 8. So he goes down there and he sees this widow woman. He's in the, the gate of the city. She's going to get some water. And he says, bring me some water. She's like, all right. He said, and while you're at it, why don't you bake me a little cake and bring it here for me to eat? And she stops and she looks at him and she says, sir. She says, I give you my word. I got nothing. She says, I've got about a handful of flour and even less oil. She said, look, I'm picking up sticks right now. I'm fixing to take it home. I'm going to make the last little cake I have. I'm going to build a fire make the last little cake I have. My son and I are going to eat it, and then we're just going to die. That's literally what she tells him. I got nothing. I'm about to eat the last food I got, and then I'm going to die. And Elijah says, all right, I'll tell you what. Just make me one first. If you just make me one first, your flour and your oil are never going to run out. Now look, I'm reading between the lines here. When she went back to the house, guess how much flour and oil she had? Anybody want to take a guess? Exactly the same amount as when she left. I need you to understand that. When she went back to the house, she had exactly the same amount of flour and oil left as when she left the house. She had just enough to make one little cake. That's all. Her situation had not changed, but you know what? She believed in the word from the man of God. He told her, if you'll make me a cake first, you won't run out. So she believed in him. She believed in the promise from God. She made a little cake. She brought it to Elijah. And it says that her and her son and Elijah ate for many days after that off this one little handful of flour and this one little thing of oil. And I, I'm convinced that she didn't walk into the kitchen one morning and go, oh, look, the jar's full. I'm convinced that every day there was just a little handful. I'm convinced that every day there was just a little bit of oil in the bottom of that jar. Amen. She didn't open up the can, the, can, the, account, the uh, pantry one day and it's full of oil. It, every day there was just a little bit. But every day there was enough. And the miracle happened because she was willing to live her faith. You see, true faith is nothing if it doesn't change the way we live. It's not real faith if it doesn't affect the way we live. Faith is the substance of things spoke for. It is the evidence of things not seen. you got a mountain that you need moved and God has given you the word that that mountain is going to be moved, then start living like it's not in the way anymore. Amen. That's right. That, that's what this passage is saying. You have a, 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 an issue in, in, your, in your marriage. God has given you a word. Now again, it's always based on God's word. It's not just wishful thinking. But God has given you his word. He's given you his promise that he's healing that and that he's taking care of that. Guess what? Start living like it's been taken care of. You have trouble with kids, grandkids. But God has given you a word. God has clearly shown you in some way, shape, form, or fashion. He's going to take care of that. Stop living like it's taken care of. True faith lives like a yet-to-be-fulfilled promise from God has already been fulfilled. As a church, I was trying to think about us as a church. Look, I talked to our staff about this in our staff meeting this past week. Um, I just believe God's going to do things here. All right? I believe God has shown me He's going to do things here. I believe He's told me He's going to do things here. And so here's the deal. we got to stop living like we're the church of last year and start living like we're the church that God wants us to be five years from now. Amen. I'm, right? I'm telling you. That's right. If we keep living like we were the church of last year, we're going to be the church of last year. Right. But if God has greater things, bigger things, and I don't even like those words, if He has different things for us next year and the next year and the next year, then it's time we started living like that. It's time we started setting ourselves up for the things that God wants us to do. Amen. We don't wait until it happens because it will never happen. True faith is living like it's fulfilled before it's yet to be fulfilled. If God gives us a promise, it's time to live on it. I want to do one more thing and then I'm going to close. Do I have time? No, not really, but I'm going to do it anyhow. Um, <laughs> thank you. So, look, here's this deal about... And, and I'm emphasizing that real faith is about living. We have this idea sometimes that if we, you know, 
And I, and I, I don't like to do this because it might hurt, but I'm going to do it. Listen, faith isn't because you speak something. All right? The Scripture says that the kingdom of God is not in word, but it's in power. Faith is about living. It's not about speaking. Real faith isn't because you speak something. Real faith is because you live something. And that's the point that I'm trying to make right here. You know, in John chapter 14, verse 14, Jesus actually says, if you ask for anything in my name, I'm going to do it. But, but, but that doesn't mean, asking for something in Jesus' name doesn't mean just speaking his name. It doesn't mean that I'm going to ask for something and I'm going to say in the name of Jesus. What he meant when he said to do it in my name, what he meant was is that you do it with his authority. And you do it with his approval. And you do it under his direction. That's how you ask for It's like when, you, when your kids go off to college and you say, now don't forget, now you're a royal. Right? Or you're a whoever. Don't forget now, you're carrying my name and I want you to act like, it's, it, I want you to act in such a way that's becoming of my name. That's what this idea here is of, of asking for something in Jesus' name. It's not just saying in Jesus' name. In fact, it's not saying in Jesus' name at all. That's not what he means at all. What he means is, is that you are acting under my authority and you are acting under, under the guidelines and in accordance with the way that I would want you to act. He takes us all the way back to what he talked about at the first. It's really about faithfulness and about serving God. Amen. It's really what it's all about. It's not about, it's not about, faith isn't about I'm going to speak it and I'm going to believe it and it's going to happen. No, faith is about I am surrendered to Christ he gives me a promise, and then I can live on it. That's what true faith is. Amen. Look, you want to just speak it and let something happen? Uh, read, what, what did I put? Acts chapter, what, 19? Acts chapter 19, 13 through 16. Nice little, little story there. Uh, the Spirit has come. Paul's healing people. Peter and them are healing people. There's some Jewish uh, evangelists that are casting out demons in the name of Jesus. They're part of the child of God. They're part of the family of God. They can do it. Then there's this, this guy, and he's got these seven sons. And they go, oh, we want to do that. If saying in the name of Jesus is all it takes, we can do that. And so they seven sons of Sceva, they came upon this guy, he's possessed by a demon, and they say, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, we command you to come out. Deacon talks to the deacon. Now there was a slip of the tongue. The demon, no, no. the demon talks to them. Uh, the demon talks to them and says, mm, yeah, we know who Paul is, and yeah, we know who Jesus is, but we have absolutely no idea who you are. And so this demon-possessed guy pounced on all seven of them, whipped them up, and they all ran away naked. He beat the snot out of them, and they all ran away naked. Listen, you want to just speak something spiritually without... Being having a life that's surrendered to Christ, let me tell you what it's going to set you up for. You're spiritually going to get the snot beat out of you and you're going to run away naked. Amen. What I'm saying is it ain't going to work. Just because we speak it means nothing. But if we live it, that's what it means. i got to just sum it up. I know I went over time. i got to just sum it up. Look, true faith is God gives you a promise and you live like it's already fulfilled before it's ever been fulfilled. You do that, you're going to start moving mountains. Amen. He's going to start telling you of some mountains that need to be moved. You're going to start living like they're going to move, like they're already moved, and they're just going to be out of your way. In your home, in your marriage, uh, with your kids, with your grandkids, on your job, at your school, wherever it is. Wherever it is. In the doctor's office, wherever it is. God's going to give you a promise about mountains that He's going to move. You're going to live like they're moved, and you're going to start seeing things moved. But it's got to come from God. Stand up with me if you would. Look, again, you know, this, this thing about faith is also true about your salvation. Your salvation, true salvation that leads to faith? No. True faith that leads to salvation is something that's lived. It's not words that we say. If it hasn't changed our life, it's not real faith. Amen. If we're not already living on it like it's true, it's not true faith. A salvation faith changes lives. Amen. And it changes yours. It changes mine. It changes everyone's. It's a promise from God. We have to live like it.
If you need to come forward for any reason this morning, you can come while we sing here in a second. If you want to come and surrender your life to Christ, you do it. If you have an issue that you'd like for us to pray about, something that's going on, let's just start. Let's start seeking the Lord and getting a word from Him about that issue, seeing what He wants to do so we can know how we need to live based upon what God wants to do. Whatever you need to do this morning, if you need to do anything, you come while we sing.